I just wanted to, if it's your first night, like, thanks for coming, we're glad to have you. Um, if you're a veteran, I just want to say, like, I think I can speak for all of us when it's been, like, a real pleasure to get to know you guys, and, um, I think we can all take so much back. Uh, I love, I've loved, like, learning about your culture and just, like, differences, and then even talking about hard topics, even though we grew up, like, on different sides of the world, uh, just to share a lot of similarities. It's been like really cool for me. So just thank you for being like for all your hospitality and just for embracing us with open arms. It's been really cool. Um, so yeah, I guess, where do I start? Um, my relationship with God, essentially when I grew up was kind of just like me going through the motions. I don't know if you guys can relate to that. Um, but I essentially would like show up on Sunday, um, kind of go home, do my own thing, live my life. Like I was just trying to be in control of my life, and um, I was watching really broken stuff in my house, like, happened under this, like, umbrella term of Christianity, uh, just to give, like, more context, my parents had a really tumultuous relationship growing up, um, I've watched my mom get arrested three times, the first one started when I was three, and, like, can you imagine how confusing that is, like, watching your, the police come to your house and take away your mom, and you have no idea why, and my dad, like, was always like, oh, I'll explain later, which now I'm grateful for. Um, but then again, as an eight-year-old, coming home from school and being like, Dad, where's Mom? And then he's like, well, like, trying to avoid my question just to find out um, that she was in prison again. Um, and then another time, like, literally when a cop came to my house and I'm, like, screaming at her, like, like screaming at him, like, not to take her away because I was just confused. Um, yeah, that was tough. But, like, I think some context with that, too, is just I grew up, in all of those circumstances, one of them, like, my mom, like, kind of blamed me for, um, and that was really tough, because, like, as an eight-year-old, like, how, how are you supposed to really understand that? Um, I have really early memories of my mom, like, attacking my dad when she was angry, and my parents, like, were constantly splitting up, getting back together, um, and it got to the point to when my parents, like, finally told me and my brother that they were getting a divorce, like, you know, people are like, oh, I'm sorry, we're like, no, this is, like, the best thing that's ever happened for our family, um, uh, until I realized, like, my dad was kind of her outlet for her anger, and then, like, when she didn't have my dad, it was me. <laughs> and, I don't know, my entire life, she tried to make my dad out as a monster. Like, I feel like it's Divorced Parents 101. You don't really, like, talk about the other. You kind of, like, let them develop their own opinions. But this was very much like she was trying to demonize my dad. Like, so much so where I, like, wouldn't want to go to hang out with him when it was, like, our time to go with him. And that was really heartbreaking for me because... My dad is my hero, and just to think, like, I was digging this, like, canyon in between us um, for no reason, and, like, he probably didn't even understand why, like, his little girl is doing that. Um, yeah, and so my mom was an alcoholic, like, I've come to realize. She was very verbally and physically abusive growing up, and I basically, like, suffered alone besides um, Lindsay. <laughs> She's back there in the earrings and my brother and like a few trusted friends um, and like volleyball was my outlet too um she would those are, those are the only people that knew because she would like threaten me if like i were ever to cast her in a negative light um which was tough because then you're just like suffering in silence and i thought it was like a normal thing uh i thought this is like was a normal like mother-daughter relationship um and then until i started hanging around my friends parents and being like huh like this is not how other moms like treat their kid um, yeah, but just to give you some context, I have, like, a recent, like, text message from her and something, um, really bad happened in October, and there was, like, a whole vacation with my family, and this is kind of a common theme of our family vacations, like, I never, I look forward to them, but not really, because I know there's, like, a bound to be a blow-up somewhere, and she had, like, not only, like, attacked, uh, like, attacked me, but, like, my grandma, too, and my grandma, like, Karen's, met, like, she's, I literally think she's, like, an angel walking on this earth, and so I was, like, oh, you can mess with me, but not my grandma, you know, and so, but I learned, because this was, like, a common theme growing up, um, how to handle her, so I just tried to avoid it, and ended up getting this, I sat on the beach by, by myself, and, um, I ended up getting this nasty text, and I texted her back and said, mom, I love you so much, but I'm sick of walking on eggshells and never knowing what is going to set you off. If I just keep on acting like everything is okay between you and I, nothing is going to change. Um, that kind of unpredictability and abuse, I just refuse to have my kids around one day. It's not normal. I want to help and love on you, but I need some accountability. And she was like, fuck you, Kayla. You are no longer my daughter. Find a place to go for Thanksgiving and Christmas because you are not invited to my house. Selfish bitch. Keep 
throwing me under the bus like you did as a baby. Fuck you. Figure out how to pay for the rest of the trip. We will not be doing a vacation together anytime soon again. You are not my daughter. You are my enemy. And you prove that time and time again. Have a nice life. And like, that's the kind of stuff <laughs> that way. It's like, that's, it's almost like just laughing is like my defense mechanism, but it's almost like I could, it happened so often that I wouldn't take it seriously, you know? Um, but yeah. I don't know, my skin was so thick in high school that like you could literally say anything to me and like roll off my skin like water. Um, I, I'd have to leave my house whenever she got drunk and tried to start a fight with me um, verbally and then physically because I didn't have a lock on my door and it would be like, she would physically attack me on my bed and then like say she wanted to disown me and at, like encourage that I go live with my dad. And the next morning she would come in and be like, hey Kayla, like what do you want for breakfast? And I'm like, not only do I have like physical bruises from that but like obviously emotional like it's just confusing I'm like do you not remember are you just trying to avoid it or were you so drunk you didn't remember like it was it, and I would never bring it up again because it was easier not to you know and so because me and my brother were kind of alone in it um so yeah that's some context to what middle school and high school look like for me and like sporadically throughout college too and the worst it's ever been is I was going into college and it was the fourth of July and it was another family vacation and she had gotten mad at my stepdad for literally explaining the story of how they met, like, not to her standards. And, like, flew, like, this whole blow up at the restaurant. And the same thing, I was trying to, like, avoid the situation because I was starting to learn um, how to deal with it. And, like, literally walking away and she came after me. And I had to lock myself in the bathroom. And then me and my brother, like, slept outside that night. And, like, that's why me and my, bro my little brother are so close because, like, we were essentially kind of, like, trench buddies in all of this. And, yeah. Um, so I went, when I... I was kind of like, okay, this is, I can't really do this anymore. I, I was like, talking to her doesn't work. Trying to not talk to her doesn't work. Like, maybe I'll just, like, I'm going to college. Maybe I'll just try to, like, completely, like, leave her in the dust. And maybe she'll learn that way. And so when I went into college for volleyball, you come in early for, like, double days. And everyone else's mom was, like, sending them, like, care packages. And I was like, I haven't talked to my mom in five months, you know. And that, that was really tough because if you know me, like, I'm not a person that can hold on to resentment for very long because it like weighs on my heart um a lot um so I ended up being the one to apologize um so yeah you can see like I got blamed like not only was that all that going on since I was a little girl but I was getting blamed for relationships in her life that would fail because of bridges she burned with her family and friends um when that happened with my family I stopped talking to her and like my family was asking me why I wasn't talking to my mom and so I like kind of told them but vaguely and she like blame me for distancing herself from her family even though it was like her own actions um yeah I just like really couldn't go right with her and I was getting blamed for like her being in prison once for my parents divorce like for always like throwing under the bus even when I didn't know I was and you can see why in high school I kind of had a very broken idea of what Christianity was I wasn't like all of that happening like going to school uh, to Sunday school on Sunday um and then being like oh yeah like Mom, like, tell me about your God of peace and love and joy, like, when you're not showing that at home and, like, not with your actions, you know? Um, so, yeah, fast forward to college. I had, like, all things theoretically on paper going for me, like, good grades, awesome friends and teammates, um, attention from, like, I was starting to get attention from all these, like, cute athletic guys, and um, I don't know, I got into the party scene because that's just what <laughs> college sports kind of is, um, college in general. <laughs> But I was trying to fill this God-sized hole with things, with literally anything but God. So whether that was, like, my sport, academics, like, the approval of others, um, I don't know, feeding into the attention I was getting. And that was, like, so unfulfilling for me. Like, I still felt like, huh, I should have everything, but still there's, like, some piece of me missing, if that makes sense. Um, but regardless, I don't know, I, my my, one of my teammates had been talking to me about Athletes in Action, which is, like, the American group that we are, and this is just like a small percentage of us, there's like a hundreds or so in the movement that comes radically, and um, I was scared because I was like, I'm not qualified to go to that, or I've had like a very warped view of Christianity from having bad examples from my childhood, judgmental Christians, I wasn't really convinced that there was a God or that he was, or if there was, that he was good because a good God wouldn't condone terrible historical events like the Holocaust and colonialism, and I thought it was a list of things I like had to do right and I didn't feel qualified to be there because I had done those things um, and I wasn't necessarily like ready to give them up uh, but I took the leap of faith um, in showing up at a similar meeting like this 
And slowly throughout that community, that was similar to this one, um, and meeting with people like Bianchi and Anita, like Brooke and Karen, um, Bibi and Domi, like learning more about my faith, I started to break down those lies of who the world was saying I was and what the world was saying matters and like who Jesus says I am. I learned like the awful things that happened to me or happened to all of us, the Holocaust, people living in extreme poverty or without any parents or abusive parents, colonialism, um, it break, like, if it breaks my heart, like things like it breaks God's heart like a thousand more times, um, a million more times. And I learned it was never about what I had done or what had been done to me. It was about what Jesus had already done for me, like on the cross. Um, and I think too, it was just, I realized like God, it was never God's intention for all of us to destroy each other, for like broken stuff to be going on. Um, so that like really helped me in kind of my theology. And like Jesus came so we can have life and have it abundantly. Um, and I, I don't know, I started to kind of like believe like, huh, maybe he is good. And then I realized um, it wasn't just about going through the motions and rituals of church and religion, but about an intimate relationship with God. I realized the entire time I was searching for things to fill this void in my life. Um, Jesus was just like chasing me down, <laughs> trying to give those things to me, like whether that was relational intimacy, like meaning, purpose, fulfillment, joy, peace, like patience, like you name it, essentially like, that surpasses all understanding. I literally can see him being like me trying, like touching a kettle that was hot, that I kept on knowing was hot, or like trying to fill this God-sized hole with things that weren't God. And him, him not like mad at me ever, like, but just being like, Kayla, like, are you done yet? <laughs> like, would you let me fulfill you now? <laughs> like, you're making things a lot harder on yourself than you need to. Um, and I don't know, he like wanted to lead me to freedom the whole time, but I was so reluctant. I was like, no, I got this, I got this. And then like, I didn't. Um, and so I would say freshman year, I'd be, I invited Jesus into my house of surrender, he, but he was like in my foyer, like if he was knocking, like I was like, okay, you can come in, but like this area of my life is mine, and this area of my life is mine, and like you can have that one, but not these. Um, I would say like the, one of the first ones was my sports, so uh, it, was, it was a good outlet for me, I think until it wasn't. When things started to not go my way, I'd always like use volleyball as an outlet to avoid my house and like place all my identity into the sport. And so when it started like not going my way, I was like, dang, what? Like, what do I do? I would always tell you like, no, my identity's not rooted in my sport. And then when it wasn't going my way, I was like, oh, maybe it is. Um, and that's when I started going to AIA. But when I, that wasn't going well for me. So I was like, okay, God, you can have that one because like, I obviously don't have that one figured out. And then the next season, like it was something my teammates even noticed. They were like, what? Like, you feel like you're, you're way less hard on yourself. Like you, I could play like with more freedom. It's not like, I didn't care about what my coaches had to say, but it didn't like have a hold on me. I wasn't like, if I made a mistake, I wasn't the mistake. It was just, I made a mistake, you know? Um, so I was like, oh, that kind of like went pretty well. So I started like inviting him into maybe, maybe my living room, I guess, with my like relationships. I started like going to athletes in action more every week. We meet every week on Wednesdays. Um, and just kind of really pursuing that and pursuing like really healthy relationships and like better ideas of Christians. So I think my broken idea of Christians was totally like, um, being changed and yeah I think still the like the the bedroom like there's like a bedroom and then there was like a closet and then there's like in the closet there's like a safe <laughs> and I was like god you can't really touch those yet um it was all like a process of me learning to trust him and each one that I did actually worked out better so it was like a very slow process um but yeah the the safe for me uh was definitely forgiveness I know we talked about that the other night but it was like of myself I had to learn to forgive myself and kind of like speak truth to the lies, like, okay, I'm not responsible for my parents' divorce, okay, I, like, just all, all the parts of my past that I told you about that I was, like, putting blame on myself for, that, like, I was carrying shame I wasn't supposed to, um, so first myself, and then a friend who, like, had sexually assaulted me, that was really tough, I know we talked about that, uh, the other night, so, yeah, not really a fun experience, but the way that I would deal with it is I just wasn't, so I was just, like, keeping it in that safe, um, and then actually, after that happened, I had like one of my first mentors at Cal, he initially like completely took me under his wing and would show me all to different athletes and we'd always go out to dinners with like groups of people and stuff. And he was the one person I went to about the sexual assault that happened to me because we knew this mutual person. It was confusing because I'm like, am I at fault for this? Like, did I put myself in this situation? Or like, did he mean it this way? Like, did he actually like not mean it like he said he did? Because I had called him out the next day. Um, and he like gave me advice about it. And then it came out a couple, like a, eight months later that he had been sexually assaulting girls like for years. Like he had been there for like 25 years. He's like in his 60s and he had been, 
So that was really traumatic for me because I'm like, you're like one, I don't, you're the one of the people that I trusted with that. Like you gave me advice about that and you have been doing that to multiple girls for multiple years and like sweeping it under the rug. Um, so that was tough. And then, I don't know, there was like a boyfriend who I trusted and loved and who I believed when he said that he loved me and like he ended up cheating on me. But so I had, that was a pro like a really broken time in my life. And it was kind of like a domino effect of things happening where I would be like, no, I got this, no, I got this. And like, I think after the Mo thing, which was that mentor, I was like, okay, I don't got this, you know? Um, but the hardest one, the hardest person for me to forgive still was my mom. Um, I didn't like how I had, like, I'm naturally a really loving person. I naturally like have a lot of love and like patience and kindness and joy to give. But I found myself when I was around her, like I didn't have as much of that. And I felt bad about that. I was like, there's like this, something eating away at my heart. Like there's this like, wall be between us and I hated it like it wasn't not that I felt like she necessarily deserved my forgiveness but it was affecting me at that point you know um yeah and I really don't think forgiveness is a weakness like I think it takes a crazy amount of strength in order to be able to forgive someone um it was actually like one of the hardest things I had to do but and I, I think logically like in my head I thought I had forgiven her I found myself though like in certain circumstances realizing that like oh I actually am not using my words to build her up right now or I'm like I don't have enough patience to give to her like I don't I, I definitely like haven't forgiven her um and I don't know I think there was I realized like I was really in touch with for the first time um how it was affecting my relationships like it would come out if I had had too much to drink I think and like I literally was like alter ego Kayla and, like, unfortunately, Lindsay, you probably have gotten the wrath of that the most. Love you, though. <laughs> like, she's literally, like, closer to me than my brother. But, um, I don't know. It, I didn't like the ugliness, like, inside of my heart. And I realized, like, it was affecting my, like, the sexual assault that happened to me and, like, the cheating um, had been affecting my relationship with guys. Like, I was so naturally mistrusting. Like, I was just like, you know what, God? Like, you're the only guy that's not going to let me down. So, like, that's all I really want right now. Um... And yeah, I don't know, it had less to do with me thinking, like, they deserve forgiveness and more to do with how it was affecting me and my relationships and, like, people in my life. Um, I hated the hold that unforgiveness had on me. I hated how it made me less kind to her, and maybe some of the brokenness I was suppressing and not dealing with would always come out eventually. I realized even though she's never genuinely asked for forgiveness, like, it's hard to forgive, but, like, if someone doesn't ask for forgiveness, that's, like, a whole nother ballgame, I feel. Um... I don't know, like, Maddie talked about unforgiveness and anger, um, and, like, had this hold on my heart. Jesus was asking me to forgive her and all those people so he could heal me, and so that unforgiveness didn't seep in and infect other relationships. I realized that hurt people hurt people, and actually, like, the people who are hurting us and doing wrong to us, like, are probably the ones that need us the, need it the most. Like, it's easy, I, it's easy to love someone who's easy to love. Um, like, anyone can do that, and I think even, like, if we're really looking into it, we might be like subconsciously loving ourselves because we might love like a similar quality that we share. <coughs> but it's much more moving, I think, when someone can do wrong and you can like show them love anyway. Uh, that's the kind of love I think that will like change people's hearts. And that doesn't mean that I'm always perfect at this um, or that that process is easy. But it's, I think forgiveness doesn't always mean like, okay, we can have like a healthy relationship now. It's like boundaries and learning what that looks like. But yeah, it took me four years after asking Jesus to come into my life for me to surrender because I didn't believe he was who he said he was. I thought my plans for my life were better than his. Um, and honestly, I was like really, I was scared to go like two feet in. It was a really scary feeling to like lose control. Um, and like you've heard a lot of really heavy stuff from us the past few nights. And maybe now you're thinking like, I wanted to go to California and now maybe I don't, but um, <laughs> America in general. <laughs> I wanted to end on a positive note, uh, saying I honestly wouldn't even change like all the messed up stuff that has happened um, in my life, just because the reality is like we live in a really broken world. Like that's just how it is, whether we're talking about it or not. But we see it in the news. We see it everywhere we go. We look essentially, um, and like God, time and time again. Like if you look throughout the Bible, like in all the disciples and the greatest heroes of faith in the Bible, like those are some messed up people, like adulterers, like murderers, like if, and He uses those people to like minister to a broken world so like who's to say that he can't use us to you know um if i don't know i definitely realized that in ministry too like talking to people who have been in the same positions i realized 
God doesn't cause our pains. Maybe he allows them so we can grow, but he definitely doesn't waste pains in our life. Um, I've seen time and time again for him to use like pieces of my life to minister to others who are going through, like sit in the darkness with them. Like that's a whole different thing. And I think the more broken pieces there are, I think like the more God actually has to use. And sometimes God will diminish us into dust because like that's the rebuilding point. Like that's when he can like build something new and like breathe life into ashes. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Jess shared her, the, the story yesterday and used a really beautiful metaphor. She's, I'm probably going to butcher this. Jess, do you want it? Where are you? Do you want to say it? You say it prettier than I do. Uh, I was just talking about, so there's this art form in Japan called Kintsugi, which that probably is not how you pronounce it at all, but um, the, it's about like taking broken pottery and mending it, but instead of like hiding the cracks, you use like a metal, a liquid metal to piece it together so the cracks and the flaws become like part of the beauty of the piece. And so uh, I'm just saying how the history of it is like the... Um, Japanese shogun, which I think is kind of like the king. Um, he, this is like in the 15th century, so when this art form first began, he broke his most like prize, I think it was like a teacup. And, you know, he's like the king, so he could totally just replace it with another one and throw out the pieces, but instead he loved this piece so much that he sent it away to China to be repaired. Um, but the piece came back and it wasn't repaired to his standards. And so instead he kept it at home and he had it repaired using like the metals to show the like the cracks in this broken piece. And and so I was just saying how it just reminds me of like us and like we are the king's like prized possession. Like he really values us. And then sometimes like we, either we break on our own or someone breaks us. Mm -hmm. And we go on this journey where we try to find healing and we work so hard at it, but really like we may look healed on the outside, but we're still really broken on the inside. And instead, he like draws us back home and is like, I'm going to heal you, but in not the same way that you thought you would. And um, I'm going to use like your cracks and your brokenness, but instead of them bringing you pain, I'm going to use them to bring healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And it's crazy too, because I don't know if there's a Bible app and they do a verse of the day. And I was going to use that story. And... 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 9 says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. And I feel like that really kind of relates to that. Because um, when, we're, when we're building our house on a foundation, like an unshakable foundation, like in stone instead of sand... Like, things in our life will happen, and, like, sure, we'll sway a little bit, but we won't be completely knocked down. Like, before, I think I, like, really knew Jesus and was, like, pursuing my faith. It was, I, I was building my house on sand. I would, like, something would happen in my life, and because my identity wasn't in the right place, like, it would just completely fall down. And now things in my life, like, it doesn't mean, like, now that I'm Christian, everything's perfect. It means, like, I have a solid foundation that, like, can't c crumble. Um... And sure, like, there's historical evidence to prove the gospel, but I think what's most proof to me that Jesus is alive and real and still is in the change in my own life because I've finally surrendered. Um, and it's present in the lives of others, too. Um, there's been so much healing and restoration with my mom. Recently, literally this year, she has been trying to, like, give up drinking and starting to go to Bible studies and um, even, like, trying to improve her physical health, which has been so, like, a huge answer to prayer. Like, I never really thought that would happen. Um, yeah, not only that, um, but God's in a lot of frustration in other ways, too. Um, yeah, and I don't know. I will have way more patience and love for her, and that's, like, for sure Jesus, because it wasn't going to be able to be on my own. Like, I wasn't going to be able to do that. Um, and just in terms of, like, how it's taught me that I only want to use my words to, like, build up other people. Like, I'm never going to use my words to, like, break someone um, or, like, try to diminish their worth because I've, like, been on the other end of that too many times. Um, and it's so true. The best decisions of my life, like transferring to Berkeley, getting involved in Athletes in Action and coming on staff have all required the least amount of me and the most amount of God. 
Stepping out in faith, this is just like crazy now that, like hindsight, I really think it's 2020, but stepping out in faith to come to Cal, introduce me to AIA and all of you, introduce me to my best friends, my passion for public health, because Cal Poly didn't, like school that I transferred from, didn't even have a public health major. Um, following that calling to last minute get in a car for 14 hours with Karen um, and go on a service trip to Mexico, introduce me to a girl named Naomi, where I saw extreme poverty for the first time and it ignited my passion for social justice. Um, it led me to going two feet in and coming on staff with Athletes in Action, which by far has been the best decision of my life because it allowed me the chance to do everything I always wanted to pour into campus but never had time to do, whether that's like mentoring girls or doing Bible studies or even like I'm interning with this big time professor, which I never would have had the chance to do had I not been in Berkeley and I wouldn't have been in Berkeley if I hadn't come on staff, just like crazy stuff like that happening. Um, and recently, I was, like three weeks ago, I was in El Salvador. I'm in Croatia now and like I'm moving to Australia in July. Just like this crazy series of events that I could, I would have never even thought were possible. It's been insane just the journey God has been taking me on. And I finally believe that he has immeasurably more planned for me than I have for myself. Um, and everything's changed in the best way when I stop making up excuses and reasons not to surrender, trust, and lean in to my faith and just did it. I wrote this in response, and it's like a, a change that people in my life, like whether they're Christian or not, like whatever, random strangers will like notice about me. Um, and like, I wrote this back in response to someone who was like, where, like, where did that peace, like where did that joy, like kindness come from? And I was just like, it didn't always used to be that way. Um, God has grown me and completely changed my heart, my desires, the way I live my life and treat others, my relationships, my entire world. He's healed and is still healing places that need to be healed, restored and redeemed areas of my life and continues to expanded my capacity to love others and truly given me a peace, joy, fulfillment, and purpose that surpasses all understanding. Um, and the more I lean into that, the more clarity, direction, and peace I get. And it's a peace, fulfillment, and joy I want have, like every all of you, like everyone to have access to. It's why I'm here. It's why I'm in ministry. Um, the one thing that doesn't change but has changed everything in my life. Um, and I have no idea what the future will like. I really don't. But I finally believe like what I'm... I'm finally in the place where what I don't know about the future is less than what I know about God. Um, and I wish I could go back to myself like that in those early years where I wasn't trusting God and be like, just do it. Like, I promise he has like immeasurably more than like you could possibly have for yourself. Um, cause I would have saved myself a lot of hurt, <laughs> but, um, I don't know. In our groups, I want to have us like just discuss two things and Please, if any part of like my story resonated with you, or if you have questions, like I'm here tonight and tomorrow, so maybe act quickly, but I would love to talk to you. Um, but yeah, in our groups, I don't know how many numbers, maybe like five or six, like just discuss these two things, because really like in my own testimony, what it comes down to is like, do we believe God is who he says he is? Um, I don't know, maybe it's asking ourselves like what's keeping us from that abundant life. Is he asking us to lose or step into something in faith so we can find that abundant freedom, purpose, fulfillment, intimacy, peace, and joy that Jesus offers us. Maybe it's fear. Um, maybe it's insecurity, a relationship, a habit, the world's narrative for success, even though we know money, fame, um, will never bring us sustainable happiness. Um, maybe it's a horrible thing that happened to you, um, or in history. Maybe it's anger, unforgiveness. Uh, I think, like, the start in this, my friends, is just, like, inviting God into that and to see it if, whether you believe in God or not, and see if there's something there that God wants to show you, um, and he will. And for those of you that may not know Jesus, it may just be saying yes to him. Um, it says, or in, in scripture, it says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Um, and there's, I just wanted to like affirm you guys, like there's nothing that can dis disqualify you from the love of God. Um, there's no lifestyle or behavior you have to give up. If you decide to put your faith in Jesus and begin walking with him, he will help you work out the other stuff later. Um, but he wants you to have life and have it abundantly. Um, and I think regardless of where you're at spiritually, um, the whole point of us being here, like you've heard, well, they, well, I guess I'm telling you if this is your first time, but you've heard like the impact that this community has had on all of us, like Athletes in Action. Um, and we came so that like, you guys could have access to that too. Like we want to help create that here, um, just because it's been so instrumental for us.